Well, my dear friends, a very, very warm welcome back to part three of this uh, very first ever Storyteller Community Day. Now, I know it's stretched over three days, but come on, doesn't really matter, does it? So, what's going on? Well, a bunch of us have got together to tell you scary stories. Now, featured here in this video are some newer channels, and they all need your love and support. So, after listening, please go and check them out. Ready for some fun? Damn right. So I guess it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink, and listen. Our opening tale of terror this evening is, There's a church in the middle of nowhere, and you should never confess your sins there, by Blair Daniels. This story features the vocal talents of Musy's Modern Dreadfuls, and your very own Doctor. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. My voice shook as I spoke. It has been two years since my last confession. Go on, my daughter. Tell me your sins. The priest's voice was low, quiet, unfamiliar. That was by design. I'd driven 20 miles from my apartment to a church in the middle of the woods. It was easier that way. I took in a deep breath, but only a squeak came out. Get it over with, I told myself. Just say it. Father, I'm guilty of gossip, jealousy. The venial sins came out first as they always did. It was almost easy to confess them. And my heart beat faster. My hands grew sweaty, slipping against the wood. I stared at the divider between us. White cloth made of mesh. The priest's dark outline on the other side. I did something terrible a year ago. Silence. The kneeler bit into my legs. The stuffy heat pressed into me. He has to accept my confession. Has to absolve me of my sins, right? As long as I am genuinely, heartily sorry, which I am, the mesh swam before my eyes. The shadow behind it shifted. I hit someone. Once I'd lanced the wound, it all came bursting out of me. I knew I had too much to drink. I knew I shouldn't have been driving. But I did. I sat behind that wheel started my car and who was it my daughter his voice was surprisingly calm no scream no gasp no groan of horror i wondered briefly how many confessions he'd heard exactly like this confessions past the normal realm of jealousy anger infidelity and theft how many murders had been confessed within these walls. I don't know. That's, that's the worst part, Father. I just kept driving. I didn't even stop. My voice cracked. Tears burned my eyes. I didn't check to see if they were still alive. Didn't call an ambulance. Didn't. I understand, my daughter. It was out. I told him everything. The tears rolled down my cheeks as I sobbed. Gaining composure, I said in a shaky voice, Those are my sins, father, and I am so sorry. Silence. 
It stretched into seconds. Then minutes. The hot air pressed into me. My knees ached. Finally, I spoke. Aren't you going to absolve me, father? His voice came from the other side, loud and clear. I'm afraid I can't do that. What? Why not? Because I am not a priest. Horror thundered through me. What do you mean you're not a priest? No reply. Who is he? A police officer? A man waiting to do something terrible to me? Somebody! I lifted myself up from the kneeler, legs shaking, and peered around the divider. I froze. No one was there. What the hell? I whispered. Wherever you are, I'm going to... Kill me? The voice came from behind me. I reeled around. A shadow flickered across the mesh, now on the other side, where I'd just been kneeling. I immediately ran to the other side, but the kneeler was empty. Where are you? I yelled. Everywhere. The voice echoed back. In a panic, I ran to the door, grabbed the knob, turned it as hard as I could. Locked. Let me out! I screamed. The doorknob slipped and slid under my sweaty fingers. Please let me out! No. The voice was low and raspy, right in my ear. I whipped around. Nothing there. Just that vague silhouette behind the cloth mesh. It was standing now. As if, at any second, it would dart out and grab me. Help me! I screamed, banging my fist against the door. Please, help! You know what you did. The voice seemed to come from every direction, echoing, reverberating, growing louder and louder in overlapping whispers. You deserve this. I threw my entire body against the door. It shook underneath me. Dump! Thump! I reeled back and threw my body against it again. Nothing can save you. You are beyond redemption. Worthless. No! I screamed, throwing my body against the door again. But I was weaker this time. The guilt pulled me down like a weight of lead. No, please! Even if you get out that door, I will follow you. Wherever you go, I will be there. The voice was dark and low. The shadow was pressed up against the mesh now. It looked wrong. Misshapen, twisted, different. Like something trying to look human. No! <gasps> I screamed and flung my body against the door. It flew open. <coughs> Coughing, gasping, bluttering. Are you all right? A voice asked. A priest stood over me. He extended a hand. Slowly, I climbed to my feet. I glanced back at the confessional. The room was empty. The shadow was gone. I wanted to run. Out the door, into the parking lot, into my car, 
I wanted to drive and drive until I was miles away from this place. Miles away from what I did. But no matter where I went, it would follow me. It would flicker across my rearview mirror on the open road. It would live in the mist on the hotel bathroom mirror. It would lie in the spare bed, roiling and twisting under the sheets as I lay wide awake. I will follow you anywhere. Raspy whispers filled my ears. A shadow flit at the corner of my vision, but I forced myself to look away, forced myself not to listen. I locked eyes with the priest. Father, I need to make a confession. Our next horrifying story is Don't Eat in Your Dreams by Penny Tails Up. This story features the vocal talents of Penny Tails Up, and once again, I'm in this one. Oh, oh, oh. Have you ever had a dream so vivid that you wondered if it actually happened? You probably have, but shook it off because of course it didn't, right? A dream under scrutiny is easily dismissed. Yet, if you've been where I've been, maybe a part of you wasn't completely convinced. Maybe, in the course of a dream, you wandered a little too far from yourself, from your bed, body, and world. Maybe you've been to the Dream District. If you ever find yourself in a place to wonder, ask. He'll tell you. He'll be beautiful, friendly, and inviting. He will offer you hospitality, flattery, and gifts. Anything you want. He'll know what you want. Somehow. Yet, a part of you will know, deep down, you can't take it. Not unless you're going to stay. But you can't stay. It's a dream. You don't belong there. If you find yourself in the dream district, Thank your host, and leave. Start walking and don't stop until you find yourself back in the dream you were supposed to be having. Do that, and hope he doesn't find you. Trust me. It started with sweet potato pie. If I had to describe it, I'd tell you it was richer than chocolate, smoother than cream, and sinfully decadent. That description doesn't do it justice. Other words come a little closer, like otherworldly or ambrosia. I feel a little pretentious describing anything in such terms, but I still mean them. Suffice to say, I'd never had anything so good and never would again. The dream started in the middle of a Safeway on Thanksgiving Day. I was on a diet. That part wasn't a dream, but it followed me there. The frustration and cravings that came with diets were hard to shake. Even in my dreams. I didn't know I was dreaming. Not at first. Pushing an empty cart through the bakery section, I made note of everything I couldn't have. Cookies, cakes, and donuts. No, no, and no. As I steered the cart round every display, I repeated my mantra. No sugar, low carbs. No sugar, low carbs. 
The words became the whirring of the wheels, quickening with my footsteps when I realized I wasn't alone. Startled, I whirled to see a sales associate standing directly behind me. The name tag pinned to his chest said his name was Moore. Moore smiled, looking far too cheerful for someone working in customer service. He was also surprisingly handsome, with skin clear as crystal, sleek gold hair, and hypnotic emerald eyes. Everything about him reminded me of precious metals and stones. In fact, it was unnerving, like a living embodiment of Photoshop. Beautiful, but wrong. Beautiful, wrong, and staring intently at me. It's a trap, I thought. I don't know why I thought that, but I did. I backed away, ready to abandon my cart and flee. Yet the impulse didn't make sense, and I second-guessed my instincts. It would be rude to run away from a gentleman who was only doing his job. There were no other customers in the store. Was it any wonder he was being so attentive? Wait, was I really the only customer there? I looked around, uncomfortable with the sudden realization. Sure enough, it was just me, him, and all the delicious foods I couldn't eat, stacked neatly in every direction. Welcome. Moore bowed in greeting, a strangely formal gesture. There you are. Do you need help finding anything? His voice sent a strange thrill through me, both pleasant and alarming. I shook my head. Wait. What was I doing there? I was trying so hard not to indulge. Why was I torturing myself? Why did I feel nervous and even guilty? Like I'd been caught with my hand in a cookie jar. Caught on the verge of cheating on my diet. Not that Moore knew that. The word diet wasn't stamped on my forehead, only on my mind. No thank you, I said. I'm just browsing, browsing the baked goods, even knowing I couldn't have them. He looked past me, peering into my empty cart. Clicking his tongue, he glanced back up at me. If you uh, don't mind my recommendation, the sweet potato pies are fresh and perfect for the holiday season. Please let me know if you need help finding anything. He backed off a few feet, but continued to watch me. I'm on a diet. I can't have that, I admitted. But I don't see any diet-friendly options in here, so I'd better go. You're on a diet? Well, there's no need to worry about that. Annoyed, I gripped the handle of the shopping cart a little tighter. Holidays were the worst. No one wanted to think about dieting, so they'd go out of their way to sabotage me, giving me permission to indulge just because it was a special occasion. I didn't want to hear it. That's not up to you, I said. You misunderstand. You're in the Dream District. Whatever your worries are, you can leave them until you wake, if you ever do. What? I looked around. At first, the scene seemed like an ordinary grocery store, with glossy cement floors and incandescent yellow lights. Yet, the second I questioned it, I could see beyond the bakery, the interior gradually shifting into cobblestone streets under a lavender sky. Yes, miss. As you can see... You're dreaming. There's no need to count calories or sacrifice your sense of taste. Of course, I have to wonder why a lovely creature such as yourself thinks she needs to be on a diet, even outside this place. You're beautiful as you are. No, I wasn't. That was flattery, but I still blushed like an idiot. Of course, now that he said it, it made sense. This was my dream, and now that I knew it, I had nothing to fear. I've always wanted a lucid dream, I said, 
a wave of giddiness spreading through me. I thanked the man before turning my attention to all the displays with enthusiastic interest. What was it you recommended? Ah, that would be the sweet potato pot. He pointed to a table which suddenly appeared in front of me. Presented prettily in a glass display case was a single pan of sweet potato pie. A beam of glittering light cast down upon it, like an endorsement from God. Moore stepped closer to the case, opening it, and looking at me expectantly. Go on. Don't be shy. I know exactly what you need. He inclined his head, but I never lost sight of his eyes. Pale, unwavering emerald. I admire the willpower it's taken to get where you are. Isn't it time you rewarded yourself? In an instant, my hesitation evaporated, giving way to gluttonous desire. I reached into the case, marveling when I felt the coolness of the pan it was housed in. The light shivered through me. My knees were weak with anticipation. The intoxicating aroma wafted towards me like a beckoning hand. Ah, there's nothing like it. Moore continued his sales pitch. As if I wasn't already sold. You can only get it here. Why did that feel like a warning? Maybe I shouldn't, I said slowly. Even if this is a dream, it's a slippery slope for me. Dieting, I mean. Why was I explaining myself to him? Whoever he was, he wasn't real. Just a manifestation of... Something. My food cravings? Somehow, I didn't think I'd find the answer in a dream dictionary. Why not? He asked, tilting his head slightly. I prepared it just for you. This is everything you want. Everything you've denied yourself. And for what? Certainly not your happiness, or you wouldn't be here. This is your wish. This wasn't an ordinary dream. Even in that moment, I knew. My senses weren't the cloudy, hazy approximations I was accustomed to in other dreams. This was a dream that indulged all my senses. Dread drifted back in, but I shook it off. What was there to fear from a dream? There's no need to hold back. My heart began beating loudly. I could feel it, feel the pulsing, disconcerting rhythm of it. I sucked in a staggered breath. My palms were hot, but the dish was cold. I need a fork, I said. You already have one. He was right. A plastic fork was already in my hand, though it hadn't been before. I was startled, but when I looked up at Moore, he merely smiled and said, in a dream, anything you wish is merely a thought away. I knew it was a dream, but there was still something unnerving in the logic of the place. I couldn't put my finger on why, but something felt wrong. I should sit down. As you wish. In a dramatic sweeping motion, he pulled out a chair for me. It was suddenly there, along with a small round table. I sat down, setting the pie tin in front of me. Pressing the tines of the fork into the soft center, I scooped up a balanced bite, a perfect union of buttery, flaky crust and creamy sweet potato filling. I will never forget that first bite, like God forged the flavor of my deepest, darkest desires. The taste of everything I didn't know I wanted. The end-all, be-all of dessert, of food, of anything. The velvety dream of sweetness and spices sent a quivering thrill through me that had me moaning for more. Fortunately, there was more. As much as I wanted. You can only get it here. I took bites as fast as I could, leaning over the table to shorten the distance between myself and the pie. The fork felt like a pretense, but I didn't lose myself enough to set it down, though the thought crossed my mind. 
When it was gone, I licked the plate, the fork, the table, my own lips for any stray crumbs. Then I remembered myself and felt Moore's eyes upon me. The glinting green gaze was half-lidded, yet predatory, with a sharp curve of his smile. Unsettled and mildly embarrassed, I straightened my back and turned in my chair to face him. If this is my dream, why are you here? Moore was unsettling. Why would I dream up someone who made me uncomfortable in a lucid dream, if my wishes were only a thought away? He'd be gone. I said you were dreaming. I never said this was your dream. I laughed at the odd reply, but his expression didn't change. I stood up from the table and started to walk. I don't know where I thought I was going, but I was done with Moore and his sweet potato pie. Yet, even with my clear refusal to take further part in this dream, I wanted more. For the first time in a long time, I was satisfied. I left the store, walking down the cobblestone path and merging in that hazy, dreamlike way into the next chapter of sleep. I could still feel more watching me, a feeling I couldn't shake until I was awake. When I sat up in bed, I knew something was wrong. The haze that filled me wasn't a typical early morning daze. It was heavier, colder, and something else I couldn't quite put my finger on. Sliding out from under the covers, my stomach shuddered with an audible growl. I was hungry. Was that why I felt... off? Instead of racing to the kitchen for breakfast, I forced myself through my morning routine. That strange funk didn't fade, but I didn't have a fever. When I opened the fridge and peered inside, nothing looked appealing. If I'm being honest, that wasn't unusual. My diet wasn't exciting. I'd been low-carb, no sugar for a good six months. I peppered a hard-boiled egg, but despite the firm whites and crumbly yolk, sawdust. It was like eating sawdust, in both texture and taste. That didn't make sense. Even if the eggs were spoiled, that wasn't right. They looked okay, even smelled as expected. But the second the egg touched my tongue, it was wrong. All wrong. A second bite confirmed it, spitting it out and throwing all the eggs away. I rummaged for something else. Nothing sounded good, but I was starving. I tried the salad next, but the results were the same. Sawdust. I choked, coughing the wilted greens into the sink before vomiting. Nothing in the fridge or cupboards was edible. My hunger howled at me to find something. Anything. But only one thing sounded good. Sweet potato pie. You can only get it here. Moore's voice brought a little color into the room, quickly fading when I realized I'd imagined it. I was awake and alone, but I knew what I needed. Grabbing my car keys, I left the house. Rushing to Safeway, I scoured the bakery. The pies weren't housed in glass cases or bathed in sparkling pillars of light, but they were still easy to find. The pastries were imperfect, with crusts cracked and crumbling. The filling wasn't the right color, either. It didn't matter. I was drooling. I bought them all. I tore into a pie as soon as I got into my car. I couldn't even wait to get home. I didn't have a fork, but that didn't stop me. I used my fingers, scooping up a heaping mouthful and drawing it to my dry, eager mouth only to start sobbing into my steering wheel, like everything else I'd eaten that day. Sawdust. I know what you need. You know it too. I needed to sleep. With the words came color and a flash of taste, but it faded as soon as the thought did.
After my tears, I threw the pies into the parking lot and took myself back home. Had a dream really destroyed my sense of taste? Would it come back? It was ridiculous. I knew it. But nothing seemed as good as it once was. Not just taste, but colors, textures, and sounds all seemed lacking in ways I'd never noticed before. I called the doctor and made an appointment, but I knew this wasn't something medicine could fix. I crawled back into bed and prayed into my pillow for sleep to take me back to that place, to that dream. The dream district. Hunger made it hard to sleep, but when I did... Well, I knew you'd be back. More found me. A ray of light in an otherwise dark and colorless dream. The details around us didn't matter. Just the warmth of the hand he extended. I took it and followed him from dream to dream until my bare feet touched sun-warmed cobblestone under a cool lavender sky. I'm hungry, I whimpered. I need more. I know. I'm here. I'll give you exactly what you need. The gnoming gleam in his green eyes should have infuriated or alarmed me. But I was too desperate to care. It was already too late for me. Now that I'd tasted that sweet potato pie, I couldn't eat anything else. Now that you've proven it to yourself, there's no reason for you to leave. He held something out to me. Without even looking, I knew what it was. Sweet potato pie. The culmination of every craving I'd ever felt. Every morsel I'd ever denied myself. In every delectable mouthful. I found myself on all fours, far too eager to bother with utensils or even my hands. I chewed wildly with abandon, even tearing through the tin with my teeth once I'd eaten my way through that dreamy, creamy filling. There was something about this pie that satisfied me more than anything else ever had. It wasn't an indulgence. It was a need. When I woke up, I cried. Consciousness felt like a curse. I wanted to go back. The world outside of dreams was overrated, without color or flavor. It gets worse with every dream. A slow spiral into bleak madness. My only respite is dreams. Even knowing I'm only dooming myself a little more with every bite. Each day becomes a race to bedtime with the window growing shorter and shorter. Consequences be damned. I lost my job, my home, my everything. And I didn't care, because I didn't need any of that. I just needed a place to lay my head. A place to dream. I can do that anywhere. Why should you ever wake again? I don't eat anymore. Not when I'm awake, though I tried to choke down the sawdust, knowing I'd die if I didn't. I can't. There's a tarnished silver lining, though. I've lost a lot of weight. I look better than I ever have. I'm a real sleeping beauty, aren't I? I know how wrong it is. I promise I do. But recognizing the trap I've fallen into doesn't save me from it. My fate is sealed, but at least I'm lucid enough to share my cautionary tale. Maybe, in the course of a dream, you'll do what I couldn't, and say no to more and others like him. I'm going back to bed now, hopefully for the last time. I'm weak, I'm tired, but most of all, I'm hungry. You can only get it here. Oh, 
third tale, guaranteed to strike fear in the heart of all, is Eavesdropper, also by Penny Tails Up. This story features the vocal talents of Penny Tails Up and Hood Horror. I'm an introvert with a counterintuitive hobby. Eavesdropping. It's not an ethical hobby. That's the thrill, isn't it? To know the secrets of a hundred strangers. Rest assured, their secrets are safe with me. That doesn't make it okay, but I considered it a victimless crime. Less than a crime. A prank. Harmless. Until it wasn't. Recently, I met a man I've come to call Mr. Soap. I can't describe him in a satisfying way. I wouldn't be able to pick him out of a lineup. I couldn't tell you the color of his hair or even his skin. Trying to remember him is like picking up an extra slippery bar of soap. I can't hold on to the details. They slip away, leaving nothing but suds. However, he did leave an impression. I can't forget his eyes or what he said to me that night. I guess to sum it up, Mr. Soap is a man with eyes and a mouth. That's the only way I can put it. He isn't meant to be remembered. A predator's camouflage. Maybe you've talked to him. Or something like him. There's no way to know. Not unless it wants you to know. I was at the bar, my favorite haunt. A place where alcohol brings up a backwash of honesty. I'd snagged my favorite corner booth wore my muted Bluetooth headphones and played mindless phone games between fizzy sips of ginger ale. If anyone tried to talk to me, I'd pretend not to hear them. In other words, the perfect Friday night. My ears picked through threads of conversation, seeking something sordid to pique my interest. I dove in and out of discussions, swimming through the currents of confabulation like it was an Olympic sport, until one voice cut through the noise. What would you trade your soul for? The voice had a velvety baritone with an air of confidence that belied the bizarre nature of his question. I took note of his strange pickup line, pausing to listen with rapt attention. Eternal life, of course. If I don't die, I'd never have to pay up, right? A feminine titter followed the question, her voice pleasantly soft and slurred. You are as smart as you is beautiful. <laughs> Surprised, I glanced over, nearly dropping my ginger ale when I met his waiting gaze. The man's eyes seemed to smile, though his mouth was an impassive line. The woman he'd been flirting with left without a word, smiling with a glass in hand to rejoin a group of giggling young women. A swing and a miss. I quickly looked away, pretending to be preoccupied by my phone. I hated being noticed. I preferred to be a fly on the wall, at most an extra background of the drama that played around me. Once again, I began sifting through the conversations, but I was pulled back by that same voice from before. What would you trade your soul for? My head swiveled in the direction of his voice. This time, the man, Mr. Soap, was not at the bar, but leaning with his elbows on a table speaking to a muscular man who had lost his shirt and stared, glassy-eyed at the table. I want to be rich and famous, the shirtless man said, not looking up. 
Classic. No one ever wants that. His sarcasm was obvious, but Mr. Soap's eyes still hadn't left mine. I watched, transfixed, as he scribbled something down in a notebook I hadn't noticed before. There was no point in pretending I hadn't been listening in. I was thoroughly unnerved. I tried to flag the server for the check, but she didn't notice. Walking right by, compelled by nervous impulse, I looked back at Mr. Soap. He was closer than before, yet no more distinct. I realized with a start that each time I looked, he was one table closer, closing the distance between us. We were separated by one table, locked in a staring contest. I never saw him blink. In fact, his eyes, whatever color they were, had no reflective qualities. The light did not catch in his irises or have the same glossy, wet quality as eyes do. His dilated pupils were dull darkness, one that couldn't be explained by a need for eye drops. My line of sight was broken by the server, who took the seat across from him, not seeming to notice that the table was already occupied by some indistinct demon. I could not see his face, but I still heard him ask that very same question. What would you trade your soul for? There are some things you know without having to be told. What I knew in that moment was that I couldn't let that man reach me. I fumbled from my purse, fishing out a few bills to leave on the table. If I hadn't had cash, I would have tried to dine and dash. That's how desperate I was to leave. I didn't dare my eyes to wander, moving towards the door. What would you trade your soul for? The same question. A phantom outline hovered dark on my periphery. A blackness that bit I turned around. I reached for my phone intending to turn on music to block out that voice and the answers that followed. I had left my phone on the table. I know it was stupid, but these days losing a phone is like losing a finger and, and that's putting it lightly. The table was mere footsteps away. I'd grab it and go. I hurried back, but Mr. Soap was waiting for me there. My phone was where I'd left it, daring me to pick it up. The man didn't say a word at first, watching me with an unsmiling mouth and those strange eyes. I found myself locked in place, an unwilling competitor in another staring contest, until he gestured and said, Just sit down. I did. My own will was irrelevant. I was compelled to comply. Running was no longer an option. How about we start with an apology? My tongue was heavy with nerves. I heard something I shouldn't. Something beyond the realm of even the juiciest gossip. I didn't understand it, but that didn't matter. I knew that to my core. I'm sorry. Now that's, that's a whole lot better. Mr. Soap reached across the table and pulled out my earbuds. They came out with an uncomfortable pop that had me reaching up to rub my ears. It was clear the conversation was far from over. Before I could think better of it, I asked, aren't you going to ask me? Ask you what? He knew, even without asking. This exchange was as entertaining for him as it was terrifying for me. What I would trade my soul for? My voice was stilted and unsure. 
I didn't want him to ask. I didn't want to answer. I instinctively understood that this question couldn't go unanswered, as though it were an implicit law of the universe. No, baby. His abrupt answer left little chance to feel relieved. Mr. Soap spoke matter-of-fact, adding, You have nothing to trade. <laughs> A remark which jolted any sense of relief into an unsettling uncertainty. What do you mean? Mr. Soap laughed low, pausing to decide if he'd answer my question. To answer was simultaneously an act of generosity and cruelty. To keep up with production, you know, souls are a lot smaller than they used to be. You know, most folks don't even have one. Only about half the population. In fact, you don't even need it. It only really matters when you die. I didn't want to believe him. But I did. I hung on to every word. He let the implications sink in, pausing for dramatic effect. So, for so, now, nah. that makes you uh, unimportant to me. You know, although I don't appreciate your rudeness, but nobody like an eavesdropper. I am sorry about that. I was only interested in gossip, not an existential crisis. Can we forget this ever happened? I implored earnestly, eager to end the conversation. I apologized. I had nothing to give him. Why couldn't we leave it at that? Do you want to know how to tell? Mr. Soap continued as though he hadn't heard my question. Tell what? I asked haltingly, hesitant. You know, who has a soul and who doesn't? I don't want to know. No. I honestly didn't. This was forbidden knowledge, the kind that came with consequences I couldn't begin to comprehend. My answer was irrelevant. Look, look, I tell you anyway. You know, it's nice to have a real conversation for once. However one-sided it might be. But, you know, your kind ain't never really much for conversation. My kind? Despite my desperate unwillingness to talk, I found myself asking anyway. You know, uh, introverts. Soulless. Introverts? Is that really the distinction? I dubiously shook my head, unsettled by the thought. It's really, really the most common symptom. And it make my job a whole lot easier, baby. Your job of trading for souls? <laughs> no, no, that's above my pay grade. You know, I'm just a scout looking for leads, man. That's all. Nothing special. You know, I find a better side soul. And I see what kind of trades, you know, would interest them. Then get a leads to someone in sales. You know, I'm just a businessman, baby, that's all. What are you? Now, you already guessed the answer to that. I'm what the... What the Christians would call a demon, you know. My disguise ain't perfect, you know, but you wouldn't be able to spot someone from a higher order. Your eyes. Those blank, unblinking eyes. Even up close, I could see nothing in them. No light. No reflection. I come from the high places. You know, where I'm from, it's real dry, man. Super dry, as you, you know, you probably could imagine, right? I leaned back in the booth, closing my eyes and mashing my fingers into my temple. 
A headache had already formed, and bile threatened to bubble up with every exhalation. What's going to happen to me? I ripped off the band-aid, flinching in fear as I anticipated his answer. You talking about when you die, or are you talking about right now? I was speechless at the question, and honestly, too terrified to know the answer to either. However, at least I could infer from his reply. I wasn't going to die. Not right then. You will be punished. Of course, that's all the fun, right? But when you die, you will rot in the ground. And really, that's about it. Or you'll be ash, you know, depending on what you and your family work out. Or how much money your family got after you did. I tried to swallow the lump in my throat. I was regretting everything. But regret is in the time machine. My actions weren't undone by my remorse. What punishment? Your ears. What? I had to have misheard him. I have your ears. He fingered napkin-wrapped cutlery in a thoughtful way, as though he were debating between the knife and the fork to do the deed. I immediately clapped my hands over my ears, squeezing my eyes shut, as if that would do me any good. No! Punishment should fit the crime. He stood up and walked over, sliding into the booth beside me. If you're gonna listen to things that you shouldn't, it's poetic justice, ain't it? Now, lower your hands unless you want me to take them too. My hands dropped down to my sides, dead weight, but the choice hadn't been mine. Mr. Soap licked his index finger, flexing it for a moment. He didn't break eye contact, but did offer a grin, before he suddenly plunged his finger into my right ear. I cringe in revulsion, disgusted by the sticky wetness of his finger. It didn't stop there. The demon drove his finger deep into the canal, perforating the eardrum, and beyond. I couldn't even scream, but I could feel everything. His finger moved like a snake, creeping and curling into the folds of my brain. I don't know how I didn't die or go deaf. I do know that it was an agony beyond anything I'd ever felt or would ever feel again. Seconds stretched out like hours, but it did end. After, the tip of his finger erupted from my other ear, wiggling as if to say, Hello. <sighs> In one ear and out the other. Mr. Soap laughed at his joke, abruptly jerking his hand away. He proceeded to use the napkin on the table to wash up, dipping it into a cup of ice water, and humming to himself as he mopped up surprisingly little blood. He even used the tines of a fork to clean underneath his fingernails. What? 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 I managed to sputter out, still trying to process what exactly had happened. Unsurprisingly, I couldn't think straight. You are my ears now. Was all he said, before he excused himself from the table and left. He took my earbuds with him, swinging them jauntily at his side. I don't know how long I sat there, but eventually I made it home. Even convinced myself it was a dream, that my brain hadn't been rewired by a demon's index finger. Life continued as normal for a while, but I didn't go back to eavesdropping again. Not for a long time. Eventually, the old itch came back, and I had to scratch it. I had rationalized that Mr. Soap was a figment of my guilty conscience.
when you do something you know is bad, it's bound to manifest as a guilty nightmare now and then. Right? Wrong. Same bar, same booth, same hobby. And the gnawing tension competing with denial. I closed my eyes and sorted through the clouds of conversation for a gem. When I heard a voice whisper against my ear, Go and ask them. I could feel his arid breath. I swiveled my head to see. Mr. Soap was not sitting next to me. I let out a sigh of relief and sagged back into my seat. But my relief was short-lived. You my ears, baby. Or have you forgot? The women you were just listening to, go and ask them. I found myself standing, walking on stiff legs to a cluster of middle-aged women at the bar. You can probably guess what I asked. What would you trade your soul for? I spent that night and every following Friday scouting out leads for Mr. Soap, forced to follow his every directive, asking that same question over and over. My voice would vibrate with the words. I'd always get an answer, usually followed by the demon's sarcastic commentary. His punishment was a life sentence. I'll always have his voice in my ear. But it didn't end there. He sent me a gift for my hard work. One day, I found a square cardboard box sitting on my porch. Scribbled in black sharpie were the words, Soul, choose wisely. I wasn't meant to laugh, but I did. Trust the demon to give me a soul, only so he could take it back later. He's already showed me his cards. I knew exactly what he was trying to do. For the soulless, there is no afterlife. There won't even be blackness. I'll simply blank out of existence. As terrifying as that might sound, it's actually a blessing. I can't imagine heaven away to demons accomplice, unwilling or otherwise. Nice try, you slippery bastard. I laughed, wiping tears from my eyes. The box collects dust on my bookshelf. Mr. Soap already has the rest of my life. I won't let him have my death, too. One day, all the things that you hear you will realize that you never heard them. You will realize that all the things you saw, you never saw them. You will realize that all the things you said, you never said them. You will realize that you've been lied to. You will realize that you've been deceived. But by the time you realize, it'll be too late. And you will spend a whole eternity burning, burning right there next to me. Do you hear me, baby? Next up is the last full service gas station in Parrot, Georgia by Ronnie 14. This story features the vocal talents of Flesh Ward and Mad Chat. I had nowhere to go. I wasn't in any particular rush at all on this grueling Georgia highway. I had no job, no family, no boyfriend, nothing but my own aimless thoughts and broken dreams. Nothing but my lonely cynicism for company. Sure, I got by okay. Once in a while, I sold a creepy painting or two, but as a struggling artist, my income wasn't steady. And now here I was at 30, single, homeless, 
still chasing a mirage. A millennial drifter without a cause. But this Monday afternoon, I stayed calm and collected. Behind my blue aviators, I stared on at the bruising sunlight. Late February, and I didn't even need the heater on. Not even a hoodie. The white arctic monkey's tee and tight jeans were enough to combat this lukewarm Georgia winter, one that'd been growing weaker since Valentine's Day. Like a captain cruising the smooth southern sea, I drove on down this four-lane blacktop. Not a soul was in sight. No cops. No houses. Yet another lonely road trip for Lee. I'd just come back from completing a sail out in Columbus. Now with some spare cash for once, I was making my way back to my hometown, back to Cairo, Georgia. I had some possible business down there. Brad Haskell was wanting me to do some gory book design. He's one of those indie horror writers, you slash Brad Haskell. I think he tried teaching but failed at that. Haskell was apparently the reclusive type, from what I understand. Then again, so was I. Normally, I took the interstate to Cairo, but what was the rush? Hell, Haskell wasn't expecting me till tomorrow. My family was long dead. What good would a haunted homecoming do? If I'd been on this route before, I damn sure couldn't remember. Not a good sign, but as long as this old Honda's radio was working, I couldn't complain. Even with no USB port and a CD player that'd been broken since 2016. Besides, all the surrounding farmland and forests offered pretty scenery. Not to mention, shelter for when I drank a few beers earlier. I passed a few highway towns about an hour ago, but hadn't seen anything since. At first, the radio offered me solace from the boredom, but as the dull drive continued, the tunes faded away, all of them gone for good once Feral and Daft Punk's Get Lucky hit sudden static. Each channel was the same. There were no familiar rock songs to comfort me. Hell, I couldn't even find a country station or mad preacher attacking the airwaves. Everything was scratchy. The sound of snow off a defunct TV. I stole a glance down at my iPhone 5. Of course, there was no service. What a shock. Groaning, I confronted the highway, felt my anxiety and awkward adrenaline rise. The scan button didn't help. Every station was a lost signal in this Georgia galaxy. The turbulence made me cringe. The high-pitched pattern scrambled my mind. Up ahead, a speed limit sign caught my eye. 45 miles per hour. The drop off, so sudden. I glanced toward the speedometer, and then my heart sank. There was less than one gallon left. How did I not notice this? I had just filled up in Columbus. No way this shot out Honda huffed gasoline that quick. Panicking, I looked out the windshield. No city signs offered me hope. I didn't even see a house, much less a gas station. Shoot, I muttered. Bracing myself for this endless montage of trees and crops, I gripped tighter to the wheel, mashed the pedal down further, the speed little support for my ever-growing unease. The parade of white noise still assaulted my ears and accelerated my fears. This transmission from hell taunted me. Only instead of being lost in space, I was trapped in South Georgia. For the first time this winter, I felt sweat drip down my dark beard. My restless eyes glued to the station, to this mysterious terrain. And then, I saw it. A shabby building up ahead on the left, its wood all sign so prominent, the promise of gas pumps waving me in. Yes! I shouted. With a victorious flourish, I turned off the radio, relished this first real silence, a smile on my face, until I got closer. Then I saw the marquee underneath the Woodall sign, 30 cents, read its unleaded gas price. Holes and cobwebs covered the sign, 
Faded posters ran along the store's busted windows, the parking lot long empty since 1958. This was a Norman Rockwell graveyard, those useless pumps nothing more than neglected tombstones. Ah! I yelled. Behind my aviators, I checked the fuel gauge. The arrow drifted closer to E. I knew I needed salvation in the middle of nowhere, and fast. Returning my gaze to the open road, I stayed on the lookout for another mirage. My body shivered beyond control, the dread dominant. This rear projection of trees ran on and on. The intermittent flash of a barren field, the only other sight I saw, never mind cars, never mind an actual human being. I stole a look out towards the woods, but even they looked empty. God, come on. I faced the highway once more. My Honda feeling every pothole this old road had to offer, despair latched into me. In my gut, I felt the gauge's weakening needle taunt me with every passing second. A blue wooden sign appeared. A handmade beauty she was. Welcome to Parrot, Georgia, the town of the Long Riders. Painted azalea flowers surrounded those letters in a colorful tapestry. The Southern Shrine, a sight to see for these sore eyes. Yes, I said to myself. Now I really focused. Did my best to ignore the unwavering unease. At first, there was just more green inferno. More of this rural hell. Until a cute wooden convenience store caught my eye. Tilling Hass Country Store, read the cursive sign. The gas station was a sprawling log cabin. A row of many rocking chairs sat on its front porch. There were only two pumps, more than enough for such an isolated location. Chuckling, I pulled in closer. Of course, there was nothing nearby. No houses or any real competition for Tilling Hasts. The store with a monopoly on Desolation Row. I saw more advertisements tacked onto the main sign. Bright paint, the closest these owners could afford to neon lights. Cold beer lotto country cookbooks, proclaimed the tourist trap. And then there was my favorite, last full service gas station in Parrot, Georgia. Now that was really something to be proud of, I joked to myself. My smirk stayed omnipresent as I made the left turn pulled right into the pump closest to Tillinghast's heavy front door. I killed the ignition, tore off my sticky sunglasses. Finally, I could exhale. Whew, we made it. I confided to my Honda. The gauge needle hovered midway through the letter E. We sure cut it close, sweetie. Smiling, I gave the dashboard a reassuring pat. You never let me down. Basking in the calm relief, I grabbed my useless phone, stepping out into the February heat. The perfect weather stole my sweat. Not too hot, not too cold. The bright sun, a spotlight for wherever the hell I was stranded at. Tilling Hasts was trapped in a time warp. Somewhere between 1950s small town Americana and post-recession decay. Basically, a Woodall's with a pulse, albeit a weak one. Chipped paint coated those lifeless rocking chairs. The small speakers outside played scrambled static. White noise, save for the occasional burst of Roy Orbison's high notes, or Patsy Cline's confidence. I couldn't hear much of anything, except the powerful ceiling fans swirling out of control in the store. I scanned the scene. Some trepidation halted my brief euphoria. I was the only car here. The only thing present from this millennium. But there were some signs of life. Not just in the spiderwebs, but the garbage can chock full of fresh trash. The wild skid marks running up and down the store's battered pavement. One look at the gas pump confirmed my suspicions. No card reader. That technology apparently hadn't quite caught up with Parrot yet. After all, why curb their strange hold on the full-service industry? Great. 
I said in my low southern accent. I faced the store's red door. The peeling paint on rotten wood made me feel as if I was about to enter a crypt. Sighing, I stepped towards it. The door burst open. A dying ding erupted from its bell. And there stood Mr. Full Service himself, a tall man with stringy yellow hair, his bulging dark eyes wide awake for what must have been the longest shift on earth. The gray coveralls fit over the man's beer gut and broad shoulders. A curse of tilling Hast Country store patch fitted over his heart, the uniform's cap somehow over his dirty blonde cobwebs, and the patch's name tag fit the middle-aged man's unassuming grin. John. Too weak to close on its own, the front door gave me a sneak peek at what awaited inside. I saw the ceiling fan still whirling, a wider range of stocked shelves, but not a customer in sight. How can I help you? John said in a raspy voice. The gas station attendant looked dutiful, but distant. A black and white caricature brought to life with depressing realism. Judging by his voice, those years spent in the 50s must have really made him dependent on cigarettes. Uh, I guess just fill it up, I said with an awkward smile. Still staring at me, John nodded. He staggered towards my car his steps slow and clumsy. Exhausted from the grueling graveyard shift, I stopped closer to the doorway, and then I heard it. A light movement, not a footstep, but a quick dragging noise. A heavy sliding sound. I looked over at John. Hey man, do you want me to pay first? In a sudden outburst, John confronted me. No. He said. Just stay right there. I'll let you pay inside later. Startled, I stood still. The noise was now gone. Gone within the depths of Tillinghast Country store. Uh, okay, I stammered. Now my fading beer buzz was gone for good, as was the fleeting hope I felt earlier. The anxiety coming back with a vengeance. I watched John stick the pump's handle into the tank. The routine nothing more than a miserable ritual for him. I stayed silent. Awkward. Finally, John faced me. You doing cash or credit? Beneath his cold stare, I hesitated. Debit. John waved inside the store. I'll scan it in there. He stole a glance back at the pump. Those crawling numbers still with a ways to go. John looked at me. You're not from around here, are you? I forced a smile. Nah, I was heading down to Cairo. Not saying a word, John turned his attention back to the task at hand. His eyes glued to the pump's slow ticker. Harsh static filled our silence. Nervous, I looked up at the speakers. Those distorted sounds still scared the hell out of me. You know... John began, his tone hitting a weary pathos. I faced John, watched him keep a trembling grip on the pump's handle. The best thing we can do is get the hell out of here. John continued, his soulful eyes pierced into my baby blues. That's all we can do. My fear only increased. Pardon? I said. The pump's cryptic chime made me jump. All the numbers now dead still. You heard me. John said. He yanked the handle out. If we don't get the hell out of here, I'm gonna have to give you to him. He said, in a voice veering towards madness. Shivering for the first time in February, I motioned towards him. Look, I don't know what. With a frightened flourish, John jammed the handle into the gas pump. I'm telling you for your own good, boy. He yelled, behind a terrified expression. We need to get the hell out of here, both of us, now. I took a step back. No, you're not coming with me. John marched towards me, his footsteps loud. His crazed desperation even louder. 
If you don't, I'll have to feed you to her. I have no choice. Like a cornered child, I stumbled back against the wall, held my pathetic hands out. No, get back. Help me, John wailed. He reached toward me. Please, let's go. Now. Back the hell away. John's strong grip latched onto my shoulders. He leaned in, inches away from my face, his stare pleading me. We have to go now. Straining, I struggled to break away, but John's stranglehold was too tight. Get off me. Please. John yelled. Tears formed in his eyes. Please help. Please. Help me. Using all my might, I gave him a hard shove. John staggered back, way off balance. His look of horror met mine, our scared eyes matching, until John hit the garbage can and collapsed to the pavement. There was a sudden crash, a gruesome puncture piercing through the tension. Oh no, I yelled. I ran up to the attendant, but... I was too late. Much too late. John remained on the ground, all the fast food wrappers and empty bottles surrounding him like funeral flowers, except for one beer bottle, the one John himself had crushed. The long necks glass stayed lodged beneath his head, the sharpest shrapnel stuck straight through his scalp, forever pinning the cap to John's blonde hair. Blood flowed amongst the Bud Light backwash. John's eyes at a cold standstill. His breaths completely gone, but the static continued. A sadistic chorus to my ears. An uncanny orchestra of scratches and distortion that never let up. I watched John's crimson flow to my feet, felt the fear fillet my flesh, shivering in that perfect weather. I now saw blood spread out in all directions, from under John's cap, past the coveralls, through the trails of trash, all the score, fresh paint for tilling Hast's much needed renovation. Turning, I looked toward the open front door, the clinical lighting inside lacked warmth, the isolation immense. This convenience store still awaited its next customer. Forget that, I muttered. Immediately, I hopped inside the Honda, eager to escape. I jammed the key in, turned it. The engine sputtered, gasping for breath in the steady sunlight. Come on, I cried. Another turn did nothing, and neither did the next. The car wouldn't crank. Hell, I couldn't even get the radio on. The full tank had done nothing but erode what little was left of my Honda's soul. She was a horse too weak to continue, literally on her last leg. But what disturbed me most wasn't the car's abrupt flatlining, nor its futile final breaths, but the fact my gas gauge hadn't moved at all. The needle was still stuck on me forever. Now in panic mode, I checked my iPhone. There was still no service, not to mention I had a battery now hovering under 20%. I punched the steering wheel. God. Tears of horror slid down my cheeks. I sat there helpless, all alone, until I turned to face the store's front door. The opening just beckoned me, providing me faint hope. Yet another mirage. I left the Honda behind, stumbling to the store. My scared steps kicked up Don's blood. H hello I cried. Then I stepped inside, saw the small room conquered by shelves and shelves of snacks, fridges of cold beer and soda. Trembling in the cold air, I looked all around me. The huge cash register was a coffin, 
the store's famed cookbooks made up of yellow rotten pages. Amidst my lingering unease, I realized the front door was my only way in and only way out, except for a door in the very back. A door cracked open just ajar. The ceiling fan's constant assault further chilled me. The air conditioning, the only modern luxury these mysterious store owners could apparently afford, as if tilling has had been preserved all these years, not through profit but frost. My teeth began to chatter. I folded my arms, the t-shirt giving me no chance against this man-made blizzard. Still, I stared on toward the back. The door now opened a bit more. Then I heard that unsettling noise. The same slow, eerie drag. What must have been a long, heavy object sliding along the floor. There were no bumps or thuds. Just a slimy slither. Cautious, I approached that back doorway. Hello? I struggled to say. A quick slam startled me. A ferocious roar through the stone. I whirled around to see the front door now closed, entombing me alive. Deep in my sickened gut, I knew there was no winter wind out there, nor any person that could have closed it. The nerves overwhelming me, I rushed up to the door. What the hell? The brass knob gave me a static electricity upon contact, but still, I turned that damn thing, terrified if unsurprised to find it locked. God! I yelled. I kept rattling the icy knob to no avail. What the hell? Panicking, I looked out a window. My voice died on the spot. Hell, at this point, I felt my soul shiver. The Honda was gone, and so was John. So was the blood. All signs of our most strange fight and tragic accident. All of it wiped clean from Tillinghast country canvas. No. I placed my hand against the icicle window pane. No way. Now I saw the rocking chair swing to life. Their paint somehow restored. All of them rocked in unison. The most customers Tillinghast had in years. Even if they remained unseen. Outside, beautiful harmonies further frightened me. The five satins, in the still of the night, drifted in from the speakers. Flawless and void of static. The group's pretty performance commemorating what was shaping up to be this gas station's grand reopening. I staggered back in fright. No, no way. All I could mutter through the crippling cold. An agonizing creep swept towards me over the hypnotic chorus of Tillinghast soundtrack. Cradling my arms together, I forced my eyes toward the back, just in time to see a red tentacle retreat further inside the room. The long, slender tentacle slid along the floor. An anaconda arm with no eyes or snout. No features of a face or life itself. The tentacle was only blood red and covered in an even redder ooze, and all the while dragging itself, making that same stilted noise I heard earlier. The cold breath struggled to escape my lips. I stood there in terror, watching that limb disappear into darkness, back to wherever the hell it came from. Lying near the doorway, I saw the creature's gift, like a Christmas present laid out just for me, one I didn't ask for. Those pair of gray coveralls awaited my touch, my body, my enslavement. In Georgia's frozen tundra, I marched towards the uniform, defeated, despondent, and still scared. I stopped and stared down at the coveralls. Tillinghast Country Store, read the patch, then I saw the patch's inevitable name tag, Lee, it said that in flashy cursive, We need to get the hell out of here.
John's paranoid voice blared through my mind. Both of us, now! I confronted the back room, not dare stepping any closer. I could still hear John's painful pleas. If you won't, if you won't, I'll have to feed you to her. His voice, driven by the desperation of a man on a nervous breakdown, or on the brink of death. I have no choice. Help me. Please, let's leave now. At least the uniform would keep me warm for those eternal shifts. At this steady job I never wanted. I gazed around my new office. My new home. Sure, the snacks and alcohol would alleviate some of the pain. But only some. And sooner or later, I'd have to go out there to fulfill my duties as the last full-service gas station attendant here in Parrot, Georgia. Fulfill my duties for both Tilling Hasts and the monster in the back. So, next time you're driving home from Columbus or Atlanta, stop on by. Let me pump that gas for you. Make small talk with you in our friendly little town. Do we need customers? Today's final tale of terror is my priest did something bad when I was a teen. It's not what you think. An original work by Sid Periwinkle. This story features the vocal talents of Somberie. I remember the days when I truly believed that all I needed to do was say three Hail Marys and five Our Fathers. And suddenly, all of my sins were forgiven. It was liberating, really. Now, it's comical. Before I continue, please don't take this as an anti-religion ramble on about how my parents were too strict and how Sunday school was too boring for my 16-year-old mind. This is something more intense. My father was a religious man, if you couldn't tell by the intro. He, my mother, my two brothers and I would go to church every Sunday. My brothers were twins both 18 years old and were attached to my parents' hip. Me? I was the loner. I was more interested in pursuing life outside of the church, but the rest of my family devoted their entire existence to a higher being. After mass, they would gather in the basement of the church with the other members to discuss the upcoming week's activities and what message they wanted to focus on. Or at least that's what I had assumed. The only thing that kept me somewhat interested in going to church was our priest, Father Morris. Father Morris was a fair, kind, and knowledgeable man about far more things than just religion. He would tell me stories of hikes he would go on as a kid with his dog Skipper. Stories about girls he had fallen in love with before becoming a priest and stories about going to Phillies games with his dad. He was a human being. One time, after church, Father Morris had asked me to come to his office with him to discuss the weekend's cookout our church had held annually. This was the party of the year for our little town of Stanley, Idaho. Everyone in the town, which happened to be almost every one of our church members, got together for an afternoon of music, food, dancing, and most importantly, the love and preaching of the name of God. Father Morris led the charge at the podium with organizing different games and activities, and he even hopped over to the grill for a couple hours. Again, he was a kind and fair man. He deserved better. This cookout 
this cookout was a little different. For the first few hours, it was just a gut feeling. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. And then it hit me. Now keep in mind, Stanley, Idaho at most had 90 people in it at the time. And not one person in the town was missing this cookout. Everyone knew each other by their first and last name, where they lived and what color tile was on their kitchen counters. Why do I mention this, you may ask? Because when you know your circle, outsiders are very easy to point out, no matter how well they try to blend in. I couldn't help but notice that there were about half a dozen people at the cookout that I couldn't recognize. They were emotionless and hardly spoke to anyone. As I was sitting at one of the benches, however, I noticed that they suddenly became social butterflies with one group of people. My family. Naturally, curiosity got the best of me and I ventured over to my family and what seemed like their old friends. The group of men immediately dispersed as I approached. Hey son, you enjoying yourself? Uh, who were those guys, Dad? Uh, who are you talking about, son? It's just us Howards hanging out. I could tell something was off, but I didn't think it was worth pressing. So I just walked into the church for some shade. I entered the church, which was a parish with 12 pews on each side. It was built in 1894, and we never added air conditioning. Tough sledding in the dead of August, but anything was better than the beating sun at the moment. I walked maybe four total steps, until I heard a voice in the distance, mumbling what had seemed to be a prayer. It was Father Morris. From the sight of things, you would think Father Morris had committed a deadly sin, begging and pleading for the forgiveness of his Lord and Savior. With beads of sweat pouring down his face, Father Morris must have heard my footsteps and whipped his head around to meet his bloodshot eyes with mine. He was frightened. My child, you must forgive me. I didn't intend for you to see me like this. Father, is something wrong? No, my child. Just a bit under the weather is all. He said with a certain shake in his voice. Is it about those men, father? He paused, seemingly defeated knowing my assumption had been correct. He wiped his face of sweat and choked back a tear. Michael, I have loved you since the day you were a boy. I was at the hospital when your mother gave birth to you. I can only do so much to protect you. One day, I won't be here. You must give yourself over to Christ. Only he can save you now. And then, in no more than 15 seconds, he was outside at the cookout once more, with a smile on his face, looking like the priest I had grown in admiration for. It was difficult for me to wrap my head around what had just transpired. Was I to be concerned? Maybe it was just the heat getting to Father Morris's head. Whatever the case, I knew better than to pry and ask questions. Rabbit holes were deep and dark in this town, and you certainly didn't want to be caught digging in one. The following week is when some of the questions I never asked were answered. My father, who would always lead Bible study, had suddenly stopped asking me to join the rest of the family or would find an excuse to send me out of the house while they would do it. Don't get me wrong. I was ecstatic. I was able to get away from what I viewed as the most tedious and mundane activity on the planet. This was heaven for a teenager. Then, I became chilled to my core. 
I came home from school on Thursday to find that every single one of our Bibles had been in the fire pit, burning to ash in the backyard. Instinctively, I sprinted inside to alert my father of what I thought he would deem sacrilege. Oh, my dear boy, we have new Bibles coming in. Those were sin. My knees buckled. I couldn't believe what I had just heard my father say. And his toothy grin. That smile burned into my mind. Um, okay, Dad. Run along, Michael. As he maintained the same toothy grin. I went up to my room, which was at the very end of the hallway on the second floor. To get there, I had to pass both my brother's rooms and my parents' room. The twins shared a room, by choice, as there was a spare bedroom that was never used. For some reason, I could never remember going into that spare bedroom. Nor anyone else, really. Anyway, as I continued walking toward my room, my parents' door was open with my mother sitting in her chair looking out to the yard, observing the burning Bibles. She had her back to me. Michael? She had chanted in a guttural voice, startled, fighting back tears with the fear of being in trouble. I responded. Yes, mother? She slowly turned her head towards me, boasting the same toothy grin that father had on his face. You know that mother always knows best, right? Y yes, mother. Do you? I hope for your sake you do. Remember, mother is always watching. Can, can I go to my room now, mother? Run along, Michael as she maintained the same toothy grin. I didn't leave my room for the remainder of the night. Not for food, not for water, not for the bathroom. Nothing. I felt as if I was frozen, despite the copious amounts of sweat that littered my back and neck. I was 16 and afraid. I had to come up with something to get myself out of this situation. It certainly didn't help that I noticed the same group of men at the cookout coming by to collect the ashes of the Bibles my father had burned in the backyard and left a small box in its place. The next morning, I woke up to my bedroom door wide open. Terrified, I got out of bed without saying a word. Needless to say, School was not an option for me today. After a few minutes of inspection, I came to find my house was empty. Something in my gut had told me that the spare bedroom could very well have been the answer to one of my questions. Remember when I told you that Stanley, Idaho was a place you did not want to go down rabbit holes? Every time I had walked by that room as a child, I would shimmy the doorknob just to see if it was ever unlocked. It wasn't. However, this time, it was. I regret ever opening that door. The room reeked of dried blood and dead carcasses. The middle of the room had a pentagram which was made of what, of what seemed to be ash. There was an altar in the back of the room, with the severed head of a goat poached on the wall behind the podium. I checked the closet, which contained black hooded cloaks. On the floor was a box, a box which looked identical to the one the group of men had left in the backyard. I opened the box, which contained several copies of the Munich Manual of Demonic Magic. I had enough. 
I sprinted downstairs and out of my house. There was only one place I had felt safe. And that was at Father Morris's house. Reaching his doorstep, I started to feverishly bang on his door. While I waited for him to answer, I couldn't help but notice that that the air was filled with the smell of burning paper. The same smell in our backyard yesterday. What were his neighbors possibly burning? Father Morris flung the door open and got me in the house. What is it, Michael? Father? My parents? The room? They? They? I exclaimed, choking back tears. Michael, Michael, slow down. No, Father, you know what this is about, don't you? The men at the cookout? Your episode at the church? Is this the part where you're going to tell me that only Christ can save me now? I could see in his eyes that he knew, but I just couldn't get it out of him. Michael, you must listen. Your family... Your family has converted. They no longer see Christ as their savior. They have given themselves to another, higher being. You knew about this? Yes, my child. They strong-armed me. I had no choice. I had to protect you. I had to protect everyone. Even if it meant giving in to sin. We can go, Father. We can skip town. Michael, you must face this. The basement meetings at the church? You've always known that's where your path would become split and where you must choose to stay on the path of righteousness. I will be by your side. Father Morris and I made our way out of the house and started our trek to the church. As we walked down the streets, the residents of Stanley began to open their doors, but didn't exit their houses. Instead, they stared. One thing they all had in common, the same toothy grin as my parents. They just, they just kept staring. We finally reached the door of the church after what felt like hours. I put my hand on the knob, which was ice cold, and flung the door open. While nothing was out of place, and there were no pentagrams or goat heads, the energy of the church was simply black. It was a pure abyss and nothingness. Passing each pew gave me an ominous and empty feeling with every step until we reached the basement door. Like I said, I had never been in the basement before. I had no expectations. Father Morris, however, was terrified. He knew something I didn't. There were only roughly a dozen steps to reach the bottom of the basement, which was dimly lit by candlelight. Reaching the bottom of the steps, Father Morris and I were greeted by a scene of pure terror, similar to that of my spare bedroom. This time, the pentagram was three times the size, and its medium was blood. However, the basement's podium shared a similar face at the helm. My father. Surrounding him was my mother, my two brothers and the group of men from the cookout, all sporting the black hooded cloaks I saw in the closet. Hello, Michael. Father Morris. He said in the same guttural voice as my mother. We've been expecting you. Come, share with us the birth of our new Lord and Savior. Father Morris slowly put his arm in front of my chest. 
pushing me behind him so as to protect me. Michael, he whispered to me looking behind his back. Whatever you do, don't. And before he could finish his sentence, he was quickly snatched by four of the men, quickly taken to the middle of the pentagram. My brothers then brought out a crucifix and laid Father Morris out like he was Christ himself. They didn't even bother to restrain me. I guess they knew that I was frozen from the toothy grin they all displayed. This is when... The hammering began. The screams from Father Morris were deafening. I could hear his bones crunch and blood spew with every single swing of the hammer. I broke down to my knees. And tears began to flow. None of them broke their smile. After what felt like hours of agonizing hell, they finally finished with Father Morris's crucifixion. To my surprise, he was still conscious. Then, they flipped the cross upside down, letting the blood from the holes in his shins flood his naked body. That's when the chants began. In whatever ritualistic hymns they were chanting, this was the cue from my mother, toothy grin maintained, to bring the torch to Father Morris. Have you ever smelled burning flesh? It sticks with you. Coupled with the screams, instinct forcibly took over. I took off to run. At first, I tripped on some debris which compelled me to look back one last time. I regret looking back. As I saw Father Morris through the flames, carrying the same grin as the rest of them, then he said it. Run along, Michael. That was ten years ago. I was able to sprint out of town and hitch a ride to Boise. I was luckily adopted into a loving family after I had told the foster care my story. Now, I am 26 and a priest at my church. I have a darling wife who just gave birth to our third child. We had twin boys three years ago. At the comfort of my office, I am able to finally say that Father Morris was right. He wasn't able to protect me forever. But now, my Savior can. Father Michael, your new Bibles have arrived. Thank you very much, my child. Run along, Timmy. So there we are, my dear, dear friends. Another selection of five terrifying stories to uh, terrify you. <laughs> now, massive thanks to everybody who participated in this. Um, didn't have that much involved myself, um, apart from hosting these wonderful narrators on this channel and featuring in a few of them. Um, please, please do me a big, big favor. Go and check all these narrators out. Give them some love, comment, like, and subscribe then you'll make me a happy doctor. Well, I'll be back again very, very soon. Lots of exciting things lined up for this week. Lots of longer stories for you to keep you all entertained. Well, once again, it's enough for me, and enough from all of us for one evening. Till next time, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. 
very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams, and bye-bye.